I want you to go ahead right now. Think about in your life, think about the person that you were the most closest to. You got it? You got it in your head? If it took longer than that, then I feel for you. You ready? You got the person you're closest to. That's what you need to know. It didn't accidentally happen. I'm going to tell you mine and Angie's connection, closeness, didn't just happen. She is my priority, and I'm hers. And you invest in what's priority in, your, in every part of your life. I got um, people ask me all the time to this day, like we, Angie and I have been together over six years now. I get asked all the time. How are you and the three oldest kids so close? Like, because, you know, and, and I know why they, and it's true why they ask, because they're much older. You know, when I was, um, when I was, um, when I married their mama, Connor was 20, Jake was 18, baby girl was 15, Garrett was six. And people ask, people are like, you know, I've never seen it so rare. They receive from you. They are close to you. They love you. How did that happen? And so I just, here's straight up, like, number one, there is no denying the fact, I cannot deny it, that I missed out. I was late to the party. Straight up, I missed a lot of years of the older three. Missed a little bit of Garrett. Missed a lot. I cannot deny that. I can never doubt that. But I, I can also not let that stop me. And so what I did and what I do to this day, I try. I'm not perfect, but I try to take every opportunity to be present in the moments that matter most to each of them, big and small. And it's different child to child. And I have tried. And what God has done is there's no denying I missed out. But God honored the effort that I've continued to try to put in and the effort that our family has put in because every one of the B family have, have been committed and consistent in the effort to build something as a family that is beautiful and different. And while we missed out on a lot, I'll be honest with you, I don't feel like I've missed a thing and I don't feel like our family's missed a B. It is rare, but it is beautiful. And the reason I tell you that is you may be late to the party in your own life. You may be late to the party in your life. You may be late to the party in your relationship with God. You may, be, you may not even have a relationship with God. You can come to church and not be close to God. You may be late, but I want you to know something. Regardless of the mistakes you've made, regardless of the time you've wasted, regardless of the, of the people that you've hurt, regardless of the hurt that you've caused yourself, regardless of the years that you have consistently paid for the mistakes that you are going to make, the presence of God that he promises you is still available. Look at somebody right now and say, it's still available. It's still available. You can be close to God. You can be connected to God. You can have a joy that is indestructible. I don't care if you're, God, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. It is available. You can be close to God. You can be so settled in the Holy Spirit and so connected with God that it doesn't matter what season comes your way. It may not be easy, but it will not shake you. Look at somebody say, it's still available. I'm going to tell you something. I still get stressed out. I'm still, I still got insecurities. I still get pissed off. I still got my junk. But I'm going to tell you the difference in my life now. Is that I don't live there and I dang sure don't stay there long. And I don't just want to change your perspective. My job as a pastor a lot of times is helping you change the way you see things so that you can make changes in your life. I don't want to just change your perspective the next few weeks. I want to help you practice that perspective so that you can actually experience what God has called you to walk in every day of your life. Because you got two choices. It's my title. You can be consumed or connected. You can be consumed or connected. 
You got two choices with every day, and it's not one-time choice. It is a lifestyle. You get out of bed, and you have to train yourself, and you've got two choices. You can be consumed by life, or you can connect with God. I'm telling you, you will, your life is not really going to change even if this situation in our country and in our world and in our families, doesn't matter if circumstances change. If you don't change, you will be consumed by the next season and you will not be confident in this season. And you can be consumed by life or you can connect with God. I'm not talking about surviving today. I'm not talking about surviving. God has called each and every one of you online. He's called each and every one of you to do more than survive. If you're looking to survive this season, you are not looking to what God has promised you. Today and the next few weeks, I want to show you how to walk in the presence that God promised you. Because he not just promised it, he provides it. The one who promised provides. And I can tell you from experience, and I can tell you my, what I'm walking out and will bank my life on today. You can have the type of presence and closeness and intimacy with God that it doesn't matter what season you're in. If your life is coming together and the promises and growth are happening everywhere in your life, you can be close to God. You can be close to God when the casket of someone you love is being lowered into the ground way too soon. And every season in between, you can experience that closeness and it cannot be stolen from you. But it takes commitment. And consistency it takes intentionality in your life we got a lot of people come to church every Sunday who talk about it but the promise of his presence is something you can't talk about you got to take and that is the difference in people who come to church people who are committed to God and people who are close to God look at somebody in your 90s voice I'm talking about your 90s voice say y'all ready for this <clears throat> You young folks, I'm getting old, I know. Y'all like classic movies, right? That's a classic. That's why I said that. Y'all like classic movies. Everybody, who, who's lived long enough to love a classic? Man, I'm telling you, y'all better wake up. Who's lived long enough to love a classic? I'm telling you some of the best memories with Garrett is when like I made him watch 90s movies that I'm not going to tell you what they are because you'll be like he's a terrible parent but we loved it classic boy I love classics I got a classic Bible story today look at somebody say we going to, back to Sunday school and I'm going to show you something I'm going to show you some things your Sunday school teacher could not show you for all my folk that didn't grow up in church say it with me say we going to take a ride on the magic school bus Y'all know they're still, y'all know they're still playing those lame movies like 37,000 years later. I, I got good nap time in those school, in that, uh, kids. I'm not a good influence on kids. So I'm just letting you know they should be over there if they're under the sixth grade. It's on you. Don't get offended. That's why they're there and that's why I don't go to that building. Y'all ready to take a ride? Go. Oh yeah. And I promise if, it's, if, you get, if you go to sleep, it ain't on me. Because this is good stuff right here. We're going, look at somebody say, y'all ready for this? Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to start at verse 22, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know where I'm going to stop and start because I tried to figure it out all week, and I just can't, so we're just going to go with it. Verse 22. Immediately after this, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross the other side of the lake. Check this out. While he, he did that while he sent people home. Big crowds, he said, go home. A lot of people don't like to talk about Jesus sending people away, but he did. Verse 23, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself. To pray. Actually, we're just going to stop right there. Throughout the New Testament, G or throughout the Gospels, Jesus went to a place that is called his, in, in certain translations, it's called his lonely place. 
Jesus sometimes to get away from people would stay up all night and he would, he would pray. He would pray to the Father. He would invest in the connection with the Father. Let me tell you something. Jesus came to the world for people. He came to the world. The Bible says Jesus said to seek and save that which is lost. He came to the world for you to find yourself and for me to find. He came for people. He went to the cross for people. He walked out of the grave that we celebrate on Easter for people. But his relationship and connection with the father took precedence over people and a lot of you have a hard time telling people no and sending them away when you need some time for you and Jesus had no problem doing it and he didn't have to send one or two toxic people away and I'm not even talking about toxic people I'm talking about people who you need some space for a few minutes Jesus sent thousands away not just one or two why did he do that? Because his connection with the Father is what gave him the strength to go to the cross. And people and the enemy and death could not change him or consume him. He was connected. He was connected. He was connected. And I want you to see it's all throughout the Gospels. He went to his lonely place. He prayed all night if he had to, but he got away. From all the craziness. And spent time with his father. And his connection was so strong. The Bible says that for the joy set before Jesus. He endured the cross and despised its shame. And then it says and he sat down next to the father. Because a priest in that day did not sit down. Because their work was never through. So this scripture in Hebrews said Jesus not just endured it. He beat it but he sat down because he was done. He won. You're walking around not even wondering if you're going to win. Jesus won. And the reason that the cross could not beat him, could not kill him, and could not change him. The reason that people, because people suck sometimes. And let me tell you, this isn't prophecy. People are always going to suck sometimes. But the cross couldn't change him. Life and people could not consume him because he invested in his connection with the Father. And he felt the presence even on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said, God, I don't feel you. But he still, the Bible says, surrendered his spirit. He was connected. He was connected. The Father, he was connected to the Father. And what I want to preach for the rest of this message to you is that that same power, peace, and presence is promised to you, not just by Jesus, but throughout the writers of the New Testament church. You have access. It's available. But look at somebody and say, are you available? Because you got to quit talking about it and take it and Jesus the presence and his connection and his relationship with God took precedent which is where the power the presence and the peace came from let's jump back into this tell somebody say y'all ready for this we're going back throwbacks classic time Sunday school didn't do good enough for you we're going back verse 24 here we go meanwhile the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind, actually, we're just going to read all this. We're going to read all this. I'll teach you. We're going to read it all. I guess I decided on Sunday. We figure out where I was when I decided it, though. Yes, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had, had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. No clarity. No clarity because just in storms, whether they're real storms or whether they're symbolic storms that you're walking through, there is no clarity when you are surrounded. Verse 25, about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came and told them, came toward them. Sorry, I had a mark through it. It's my craziness. Came toward them walking on the water. 3 o'clock in the morning, remember that. Because that's a crazy time to be coming in the middle of a storm. <laughs> yeah. It's unpredictable time, and God's going to come at you in unpredictable seasons when you don't feel him or see him, but he's active. Verse 25, about, th- about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to, oh man, I just started over. Let's do it again. He came toward them walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. No clarity. They didn't even know if it was Jesus. They couldn't say nothing. They just heard somebody say it was Jesus, and it was out there on the water, and it was dark. 
in the fear they cried out, it's a ghost. It's a ghost! I can't wait to get in this. But Jesus spoke to him at once. Don't be afraid. He said, take courage. Take courage. 2020, 2021, 2050, take courage. I'm here. That's what Jesus said. He says, I'm here. I'm here. 28, verse 28. Then, then, <clears throat> then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you. I'm, boy, I'm going to show y'all this is an imperfect man, but he had exemplary faith. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on water. Verse 29, yes, come, Jesus said. He said, don't sing it. Bring it, Peter. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, um, he was terrified. I want you to see that, man, we're going to really get into this. Doing the impossible, and he began to be terrified by the impossible. He began to sing. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. I want you to know he didn't even talk to anybody in the boat. He didn't even step out. No potential. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. And we're going to end the message on this in a few minutes. He said, after they had crossed the lake, because whatever you're sitting in, whatever you're sinking in, there is something on the other side of it. And if you want to get there, you can. But you got to quit being consumed. And when they crossed the lake to the other side, they landed in Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, this is what happened on the other side. The news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area. And soon people were touching the fringe of his robe. And all who touched him were healed. There, were some, there was a story on the other side. But you can't be consumed. you got to be connected if you want to get there. Let's start at this. So they're literally in this storm. They're freak out mode, y'all. They're in the middle of this storm. They are freaking out. And Jesus is far enough away they don't see him. And he says, it's me, guys. I'm here. I got you. And they literally say, it's a ghost. We do it all the time. God is so active in our situation, but we are in freak out mode and we don't see it because we feel like we are being attacked. There is no clarity in a storm. There is no clarity when you are being rejected. There is no clarity when there is enough, not enough money for the end of the month. There is no clarity when you are grieving somebody or some opportunity you lost. There is no clarity in a storm. And they were freaking out. And here's the thing. is A lot of times we think we see an attack coming and we go into attack mode. And I'm just going to tell you, yes, there are times in your life that you are being attacked. There are times in your life where people are accusing you. There are times in your life where there may be some supernatural attacks because of some wounds and some things in your life that are deep. There are some times, but a lot of times we're not even being attacked. God is right there and we are freaking out. Just like they were. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of times we think we are being attacked, but God is trying to put an advantage in your life and you don't even see it. And you go into attack mode and you screw it up. They are not, they are literally, Jesus is there. There is no more attack. He is there to rescue them. But they are pushing away. I'm going to tell you something straight up. There are a lot of times in your life that you think there's an attack coming and you go into attack mode and actually God is so active and he is doing something for an advantage in your life and because of your trauma, because of the things that you struggle with, because you're so stressed out and you're consumed instead of connected, you go into attack mode and you're fighting against God. I'm going to tell you. At our last church, the last two years, I really, it felt like an attack. I'm going to tell you something. It was the most, one of the most painful, debilitating seasons of my life. Oh, it felt like an attack. It felt like an attack. Like, you know, when, when things go crazy, people just start looking for somebody to crucify just like they did Jesus. Awful. But looking back on it, it wasn't an attack. It felt like an attack. It wasn't. God was making moves because he knew that we weren't called to lead that church. We were called for this. 
And this wouldn't be here. This wouldn't be here. And all the people online. And whatever is ahead would not have happened if God hadn't have made a move. It wasn't an attack. It just felt like an attack. And you are sitting in a situation. You have no clarity and you're freaking out. God's trying to do something. And if you will start connecting with him, you will quit freaking out and pushing people and opportunities. And you are in a lot of disappointment because of you, not God. We get freak out, man. It's like, oh, we're getting, no, it's an advantage. Adversity is not always an attack. Adversity is a lot of times an advantage. Look, they broke your heart. They broke your heart. They broke up with you. They broke your heart. It sucks. It hurts. Doesn't mean it's an attack. It means God's making a move because he knows that if, he, if your heart doesn't get broken now, you're going to hurt a lot, a lot harder for longer, for a lot longer. He's trying to save you. He's not trying to attack you. I'm going to tell you, I know there's a lot of people this season for single people and people who are trying to start over because of divorce and because of whatever, death. It is hard season because everybody's disconnected. I know that you're lonely. I know that you're lonely. You just want somebody to do life with. I know you're lonely. I understand it. Trust me, I get it. I get it. You may not have known me long enough to know, but I get it. I get it. But I'm gonna tell you something. One, I'm gonna tell you something that that every day, every day, I'm so grateful for all the lonely years. Every day, I'm so grateful for every person that turned me down and every person that belittled me and make, made me think that I was worth turning down. I am so thankful for the years of loneliness where I had a lot more responsibility than I did people that were present. I am grateful, and let me tell you why. Because the lonely seasons. In those seasons, I discovered who I am and what I wanted. And those lonely seasons, the, but I do not, I do not, I don't over, I appreciate things most people overlook because of my loneliness. Oh, I thought it was an attack. I thought nobody likes me. I'm not good looking. Even if I'm not, I don't care anymore. But anyway, back then it bothered me, you know. When you reel one in and you, oh, you outkick your coverage, it just doesn't matter anymore. But um, I'm telling you, I remember my mother telling me for like years, she'd say, because I mean, she saw it. My mother would tell me this. She would say, Ben, God is not withholding from you. He is protecting you. I know what I get to come home to. I know it because of the years of loneliness. I appreciate what God has given me because I had to wait for it. It wasn't an attack. God protected me. God protected me. I am not blinded to any blessing that God has given me because of the battles I had to fight to get here. But we freak out. We, we think it's an attack. One more. I got one more for you. For years, I was embarrassed and ashamed because of my learning disabilities. You don't have to tell me I don't have them. I have them. I am very, very slow at comprehending things. Even things I'm good at, like this. These notes, this is like the best it's been in a while, aren't just because I have a hard work ethic. It's because it takes me longer to wrap my mind around what I want to give you on Sundays. I used to feel like an attack. The teachers would ask me. The teachers would call me out. I knew I couldn't give them an answer. If I didn't have a good joke, it was going to be shameful. They were going to say I wasn't listening. I wasn't. I struggled. And it felt like an attack. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed for so long. But I'm going to tell you something. The fact that I'm a slow learner, God, that was an attack. An attack. God was very intentional. He knew that later on in life it was going to save me. Because I found out a lot sooner than most people that I'm not superhuman. And it's the reason that I can manage what God has given me, not just in ministry, but we have a really freaking big family. And I, a lot of people that can do a lot more at one time would have struggled a lot more. But I realized a long time ago, I get up real early and I go to bed and I sleep in peace because I'm one person. I had to try harder. I still have to try harder. But guess what? I'm better because I have to put more effort than most people. And I'm okay with it. I'm not ashamed of it. God used it to my advantage. And a lot of people would have gotten crushed. But I had to find out I'm one person. God, look at somebody and say, it's not an attack. 
You don't have to go in freak out mode. It's not an attack. And here's the thing. If it is an attack, nothing changes. Even if it is. Because attacks do happen. Let me tell you something about attacks. The Bible says this. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. The Bible says, Moses, who was late to the party, he lived the promise of God on the other side of 80. And God told Moses, he said, if you will obey me, if you will do what I say, you are going to be blessed going in and blessed coming out. In the New Testament, it says, in all things, we are more than conquerors. I love the translation that says, we overwhelmingly conquer. You don't just win in overtime, you win. You wipe the floor with whatever you have to face. Because God says, if it's an attack, all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. You want to connect with him, you will be undefeated. Even if it's an attack. Quit freaking out. God said, Paul, the apostle Paul said it best. He said, um, if God be for me, who in the world can be against me? Even if your ex is taking you to the bank, if God be for me, who can be against me? Who can be against me? Even if it doesn't matter what is consuming you. An attack God will make to your advantage. The disciples freaked out, man. They were like Fred Sanford. All my people that remember this, this is like way back. Way back, man. Like all my people, young people, bear with me. Like they're like Fred Sanford. Every time life hit him in the in it, he'd, be, he'd get pissed off and be like, Liz, his, his, his dead wife, I'm coming to you. And he'd crack a joke of how he was coming to her. Literally, the disciples were like, God, oh, we're coming to you, God, with a storm and a ghost chasing us. Freaking out because when there's no clarity, you either connect with God or you get consumed by what you have no clarity in. But Peter, boy, oh dang. Peter does something that I see very few people ever do in our time. Peter says, Jesus, say it's you. They think it's a ghost. So what if a ghost says, Peter, it is me. He says, say, but Jesus Say it's you and I'm overboard. Peter put Jesus on the spot. Peter said, I've got some skin in the game on this one, God. I'm coming at you. I'm not asking you to come to me. Just say the word and I'm going. See, a lot of us, we don't do that. We like to put Jesus on the spot. We like to put him. Peter said, say it. Peter went after God. He went after God. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of stories in the Bible that they got miracles from Jesus. They sought after Jesus. Jesus didn't pursue them. They pursued Jesus. I'll just name a few right off the top of my head. Um, The centurion came after Jesus. Jairus, Jesus raised his daughter from the dead. Guess what? Jesus didn't go find Jairus. Jairus, a temple Jewish ruler, came after Jesus. His daughter would have stayed dead if he didn't go after Jesus. I'm still not done. The woman with the issue of blood who in that time couldn't even be touched because she was considered unclean. She fought through the crowds and touched his robe. When Jesus said, power has gone out from my robe, she touched him. Put that in your pipe and smoke it when you're praying to God with conditional prayers. This woman does not find the type of healing that makes her life whole if she doesn't go after him. Zacchaeus, oh, here we go, short man syndrome, successful businessman who his business was taking other people's money by overtaxing them. It was like pimp drug dealer business. He was short, he was ashamed, and he got up in a tree. Because he was short. He threw Jesus a Hail Mary, but he threw it. And guess who Jesus came to eat dinner with? Zacchaeus. Peter said, say the word and I'm over. 
Say the word and I'm coming after you. I'm connected with you. I'm committed to you. Listen, Catalyst, you cannot be connected and close to Jesus until you decide I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be consistent. I'm coming after you. I'm not saying you got to go the whole way. I'm saying you got to quit praying and giving God conditions because that's what we do. That's what we do. Here's what it looks like in 2020. Uh, Jesus, if you will just like when the storm comes down, I will come in after you. Just calm it down. God, God, I don't want to look foolish to these people in the boat that are thinking I'm foolish. I'm not jumping overboard. Just, just, just calm the storm down. Uh, God, 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 if you will just get me out of debt, Daddy, I swear I'll never do it again. Make me feel better about myself and I swear I'll come to church and be faithful. God, bring my husband home. Let him be a father and I swear I'll have faith in you. I'll do this but dot, 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 if dot, dot, dot. I swear, God, I will give because I need to be generous and I need to quit being so selfish with my money because that's an American thing, not a Christian thing. It's called greed. It's actually a human thing. But then you start giving for like two seconds and it's not the return you thought and it's not the time in you. So no, 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 you take it back. Peter said, say it. Say it. Psh, say I won't. <laughs> say it. We are the type of people. We do church like we do the swimming pool. We wait 10 minutes in 90 degree weather because we're thinking about the dread of the chill when we first enter the water. It's a storm going on and Peter says, he says, God, you may be ghosting me, but I'm coming after you either way. You may not answer. You may not answer the answer I want to say, but I'm overboard. I'm at you. And it's not just cold water. This, it was waves. This joker, either God was going to come through or he was going to drown. But he said, if I'm going to drown, I'm going to drown coming after you, not doing life my own way. Because that hasn't worked. You can be consumed by life or you can connect with God. You've got two choices and you don't make it once. You don't make it ten times. You make a lifestyle around it and you get to make that call, not me. Just, just side note, survivors, the survivors were in the boat. They survived the storm. You don't hear anything about them. They're the disciples. You don't hear anything about them in this story because they stayed in the boat. Oh, they survived. But they were invited to walk on water too. It was only Peter that jumped in. Surviving, great. No reward in it. It's great. You know what surviving means? It means you have potential. A five-star athlete that everybody thinks is going to change the game and has a great career. It's kind of like a survivor. A lot of potential, but you haven't done a doggone thing yet. But you're invited to jump over the boat if you want to. You can be consumed or you can connect with God. The choice is yours. But this idea of God, you got to come at me before I come at you, that is nonsense. And it is the reason that we live so consumed and have no confidence. And before you know it, we're pissed off at God about a lot of things that we brought on ourselves. I'm not saying it all, but I'm saying we make it harder. This, y'all, is what it takes. This is what it looks like to want to grow. To want to be close to God. This is it. This is also the reason that a lot of people come to church and they're committed to God, but they are not connected and close to Him. This is what it, this is why we've got a lot of people that come to church but really don't know God. They love Him, but they're not close to Him. It's why it's same principle. We got a lot of adults that act like children. I'm not gonna go there because you know I don't want to offend anybody too much. I want to offend you on purpose, not for no purpose, but it's the same principle. Just because you're 18. You don't mean you act 18 or 40 or 70 or 80 or the day you drop dead. It doesn't mean you act old. It's what it takes. You want to grow? There it is. And Peter's off and he's on the water. He's doing the impossible. Let me give a disclaimer real quick. You do not have to be perfect to experience the presence of God. I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to give you straight up because I even know what you're thinking. I know what church people think because I've been in this thing a while. You're thinking, well, I'm not, I know that, but I've got to be at least closer. No, the H-E double hockey sticks, you don't. I'm going to tell you straight up, uh, baby girl's boyfriend, Will, now is like an answer to freaking prayer. 
Like all I can tell you is it was a long way to get here with my stubborn daughter that is, may not have my DNA, but oh my God, she is too much like me. Will is like, he's beyond what Angie and I prayed for for her. It took a while. But I've literally lately been like, when this is all said and done, he's going to hate me. He's going to hate me because he, for two years here at Catalyst, he knew me here. My highlight reel. On my worst day, this is still my best in the league. My worst message is the best. You, you get to see the best. It may suck, but it's the best I got. But he transitioned from two years of coming here and seeing me here to going on Sunday afternoon home. And all I can say is let down doesn't do that justice. Or on Tuesday when I've had a long day and heavy counseling appointments and I come home and he sees, man, Ben is not as nice as I once thought. But I started thinking, you know what? There is no, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be close. You just have to be committed and consistent and come after him. I'm going to love you, Jesus, unconditionally like you love me unconditionally. I'm going to pursue you unconditionally like you went to the cross and rose from the dead to tell me that you love me and you feel the same about me. You do not have to be perfect, so you better stop that right now. You don't have to be close. You don't have to be closer than me or to the person beside you. All you have to do is be consistent and committed because Peter went overboard and he's doing the impossible. To this day, we know of nobody other than illusionists that have walked on water. Look at somebody say, until. Until. The difference in Peter doing the impossible and sinking, sinking into the impossible was his focus. He's connected, he's committed, he's coming towards Jesus on the water. He's doing it. He's walking in it. He's connected. He's committed. And what does the Bible say right here? Let me find it real quick in all this craziness. It says, uh, so Peter, excuse me, it said, um, but when, when he saw the strong winds and waves, he saw what was around him and quit focusing on the God who was in front of him. The difference in your life and where you live and where you go is what you're focused on. Peter immediately began to be consumed when he stopped connecting and being focused and close to the God who actually was the reason he was walking on water. He was sinking. Oh, he, he, was, he was farther ahead than the people on the boat, but he had to learn you can be consumed or you can be connected. And for a minute, he lost it because what happens when you start looking around you is you start realizing, I need a lot of fixes. And you start focusing on the fixes you need. So you're not, you, you lose faith when you're focused on what you need from God and you've lost focus in God. Your focus is on your, the, 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 your child. And their struggles, your marriage, you're focused on what you need, uh, money in the bank. You're focused on all these things, but when you're focused on the fixes and not the God, you lose closeness, which means he, you disconnect and you sink. You want to be settled in every season and not sink into it and not be shaken by it? You've got to connect. You've got to stay committed. It's got to be consistency. And I'm telling you, it's not a one-time decision. It's a get up out of bed every day until I create a lifestyle decision. You can trust Google or you can trust God. And here the last week you can trust uh, all these Facebook news sites about everything. And I'm telling you, and all you're going to do is trust lies. Every side, lies. Google, you can have a stuffy nose and you can go Google it. I promise the first page or two at least it's going to have cancer. You got a cold. I had a, I had a torn meniscus last year and I had to go to therapy. And I remember there was a knot that came up on my knee. I Googled it literally. Most of the first page was bone cancer. You can trust what's around you or you can trust God. But you will be, and the choice in that is you're going to be consumed or connected. You're going to be closer to God or you're going to move farther away from him. The choice is on you. Verse 34, I'm going to go back to that because I want you to give you hope. Peter's sinking. God pulls him up. He says, you got little faith. But I want you to know that's like a coach coming at a player with potential. He doesn't even say anything to the people in the boat with no potential. 
Daddy used to say it all the time. Daddy used to say, if a coach doesn't pay you any attention, it's because he doesn't see anything in you. Peter wasn't the one getting scolded. Peter was the one getting praised because God was working. Verse 34, here we go. It says, when the people recognized Jesus, you can put it up if you don't have to, baby, it doesn't matter. When the people recognized Jesus, excuse me, verse 33, my bad. Then the disciples worshipped him. You were the son of God. They exclaimed, after they had crossed the lake, they went to the other side, and this is where the miracles happened. Oh, and also the miracles at the other side, look at what it says. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe. Once again, they touched his robe. He didn't touch them. They came after him. There is something, there is something on the other side of whatever you're sinking in right now. There is something on the other side. You may have been in it for years. And I want you to know, you don't have to be happy about what you're sinking in. You don't have to be happy about this season. You don't have to be happy about any season. You don't have to be happy about it for there to be something on the other side of it. Once Peter got his tail out of the water, they got in the boat, the storm settled, they got to the other side. Miracle after miracle happened. You don't have to be happy about it to know that God has something on the other side of it. But you are never going to see the other side of it until you stop being consumed and start working on your connection with Jesus. You don't have to be happy about it. They're dead. And you're pissed. You're pissed. You don't have to be happy about it. Listen to me. People suck. They're going to suck. But you don't have to be consumed by it. My people that are older, you've, you've made like you're older, <laughs> you know, you're like I've been spiraling and set in my ways for years. Listen to me. In American culture, we love movies by the ending. Man, people love or hate the movies based on the ending a lot of times. Listen, you don't have to be happy about it and it can be a long time, but there's still something on the other side of it. And it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish it. Man, the Bible says a gray hair earned in righteousness is a crown of glory. Man, if you learned those lessons because you got yourself in a situation that gave you gray hairs, you still learned. And there's something on the other side of it if you want it. And you don't have to be happy about any of it for God to still be in it and you to get something out of it. It's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to just happen your connection and closeness with Jesus does not just happen. And I want to finish this thing. Oh, it's just week one. They, they build. I started thinking to myself, I committed my life to Jesus very, very young. I was three. Matter of fact, my aunt sitting over there is the one that prayed with me to receive Jesus. I was three. You don't have to, look, I may be slow, but I've got a good memory. I remember vividly. I was commi I committed to Jesus very young. I felt his presence young, but I did not draw close to Jesus until I started driving. <laughs> remember my first truck, 1984 S10. It was my dad's. And he actually got it when he was when, he, when I was three. And in that truck, it was a stick shift. And I remember like a I remember driving to high school and I remember like worshiping in those moments. I was worshiping. I was thanking Jesus. My next vehicle, y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. My next vehicle was a 1993 Ford Explorer. I had to drive to Bible College, Lithonia, Georgia, a good bit over an hour drive once, sometimes twice a week. I did it for years to get my education. And I remember in my 93, there were times I had to pour an entire bottle of transmission fluid, brake pad, and radiator fluid to get there and back, and I was screwed if I had to go to Bronx game somewhere not in the middle. The thing drove to the left like this, and I remember like many times rush hour is still dark in the morning because you either had to be ahead or you were late in rush hour. And I remember thing driving, I'd have my arms about things sitting on the window and that thing driving and I would spend as much time before I had to grab the steering wheel saying Jesus bearing my heart to him I didn't learn I didn't draw close to God in Bible college I'm not discouraging studying the Bible but the content of the Bible didn't draw me close to God my time 
and my investment in our relationship. Just like in every relationship is what drew me close. Church didn't teach me how to worship Jesus. I learned to worship in church what I did in my truck. I remember downtown Atlanta. I'm talking about, I, I'm talking about I didn't even care that I, I last minute grabbed the steering wheel. I remember my next vehicle was a white old West Georgia electric truck. You've heard me say it had a bullet hole about that big. Somebody shot at it and didn't miss. Seasons of my life that were by far the hardest. Years before things got better. I remember driving all over the place because I did. I had to do ministry in that truck and my old church didn't have the money to pay me and I didn't have the money to put the tires and all the work into it. I remember on birthdays, my birthday, December 2nd, every year. <laughs> I remember driving and saying, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that I'm still here. Thank you that I have, I mean tears. God, thank you that I have hope. Thank you that you're not done with me. Thank you for what you have given me. I'm not focusing on what you haven't. Thank you for what you have done for me, not the things that have gone wrong. I remember on Easter's every year in my white truck, I remember saying, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. And not just dying, but raising from the dead so that I could have hope in living, not just existing. I remember bearing my heart and saying, thank you, this is years before anything changed years loneliness a lot of struggle a lot of pain a lot of stuff and I remember telling him I remember Christmases saying Jesus thank you that the hope of Christmas is that you loved me enough to become a human and hurt like I did suffer like I do be lost be lonely like I am you wanted to connect with me so you became a human being and that is the hope Jesus thank you and I was in tears but I meant every word I wasn't just doing lip service to gratitude I meant it and those are the seasons and I'm going to tell you something I'm not lying to you I've been consumed those are the seasons that kept me connected I've been consumed I have preached from this stage and other stages. I have preached absolutely heartbroken. I've preached bitter. I mean, bitter as hell. Man, I've, I've preached bitter. I've preached so sick that I don't know if I made sense or not. All I know is that it was a miracle that I didn't face plan. Last year when I had that tumor in my bladder and I didn't know what was up, I remember coming off the stage saying, thank you, Jesus, that I just didn't pass out. And I remember somebody, a guest, coming up to me and saying, what did you even mean? What were you trying to say out of Cain and Abel? And I remember saying, I was just talking about bitterness, man. And this person rolls their eyes and goes out. And I'm literally thinking, I was pissed. This man, I saw all he's got to say is I wasn't theological enough. And I remember I've, I've hated preaching in seasons. Like I've hated the thing I love because I was hurt so much by people that should have had my life. I've, I've been there. Listen, I've done it. I've done it. I've been consumed, but God, somehow I've never lost that connection because I guess I always gravitated back towards it for two reasons. Excuse me, actually. I'll give you the reason in a minute. I want to tell you two things. No, one thing. I'm an ass. If you don't like it, I mean, if you think that's an, I'm sorry, I told you, cat of kids, six and under. That's why I'm not over there. And just so you know, the ass is in the Bible. Seriously. Actually, if you're the King KJV lover, it's actually directly in there. I'm an ass, and I mean that by two ways. Number one, I am literally, if God can use me, if God can draw close to me, if he can do whatever he does through me, my goal on this stage is to tell you that he absolutely can do it to you too. You have access. And two, I'm an ass. Like, I can be short. I used to be a doormat, and sometimes I'm just the opposite. I know it. Y'all, this last several months, I know that some of my leaders that we're celebrating, you've told me some of you probably haven't. I have been short. You probably, if you know me, have seen the stress on my face. You've seen it, and I'm sorry. I'm an ass, but I'm going to tell you. 
I believe in the verse when it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of me. The same power, the same presence, the same peace lives inside of you. And Bradford asked me this question that inspired the next couple weeks, a couple months ago. He sent me, he said, can you be so settled in the presence of God that you are consumed by nothing around you? I absolutely believe it. And next week, I'm going to show you how to do it.